Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sébastien Couture. Today, I'm speaking with Federico Kunze Kunma. He's the co-founder of Evmos, the CEO of the company that is driving that project, Tharsis, and he was previously a, an engineer over at Tendermint. Uh, he's sort of an OG in the Cosmos and uh, Interchain ecosystem. This interview was recorded on a new podcast that I'm launching. It's called The Interop, and it's all about understanding the decentralized economic networks that make up the interchain, the Cosmos ecosystem, and I hope to get a better understanding of the topology of the internet of blockchains and the technologies that make it possible. This is a podcast for developers and investors, and I hope to have really in-depth technical conversations with the people that I interview, similar to the kinds of interviews that we do on Epicenter, but also uh, discuss the long-term prospects for the Interchain and Cosmos ecosystem. So part of the interview will be released here on Epicenter, and the uh, remaining third of the interview, the last part, which talks about uh, the recent hiccups around the launch of FMOS, will be released on the Interop podcast. And so there will be a link in the show notes of this episode that takes you to the different YouTube channels and um, podcast uh, apps where you can listen and subscribe to the podcast. And I hope you'll subscribe because it's going to be a lot of fun and we'll be diving deep into the Cosmos ecosystem and everything that's going on there right now. Before you go to the interview, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors for this week. Paraswap is a multi-chain DEX aggregator. This means that through Paraswap, you can easily access the liquidity of various decentralized exchanges. The protocol automatically finds the cheapest liquidity for you so that you can trade knowing that you're getting the best price for your trade. Paraswap is also gas friendly, which helps you keep your transaction costs low. They also recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, BSC, and Phantom. And you can use Paraswap directly in Ledger Live if you use the Ledger Wallet. In addition to that, they're becoming a DAO. So if you've got some PSP tokens, that's something you can participate in. The Paraswap DAO just voted for the gas refund program, which will allow Paraswap stakers to get up to 100% gas refunds on their trades on top of their auto compounding yields. You can join the Paraswap Discord to learn more at paraswap.io slash discord. We're also supported by Chorus One. If your crypto assets are sitting idle in your wallet, you're losing out. Start earning rewards and contribute to network security by staking with Chorus One, a staking provider securing $4 billion in assets in over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. If you're an institution or you want to run your own branded nodes, Chorus One's white label Node as a Service offering leverages their highly available and proven infrastructure, enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. Head over to Chorus.One to start your staking journey today. And Chorus One is also expanding their team. And if you want to make your career in the exciting field of crypto and staking, make sure to head over to chorus.one and check out their open positions. And with that, here's my interview on the Interop podcast with Federico Kunse Kunma. Welcome to the Interop. This is a podcast about understanding the de decentralized economic networks which make up the interchain. And my hope is that my listeners will gain a better understanding of the topology of these networks, the technologies that make it possible, and the opportunities that it provides to investors and developers. I'm Sebastian Couture. I'm a podcaster and investor. And I'm here today with Federico Kunse Kulma, uh, who's the um, co-founder of Evmos and the CEO of Tharsis. Uh, thanks for joining me, Fede. Hey, Sebastian. Uh, thanks uh, for having me today. Really excited to uh, be part of the intro and also uh, this new venture that you're starting. This is a, a new podcast. It's called The Interop. Uh, this episode is going to go out on Epicenter, uh, which is my my other podcast, but also go out on The Interop. Uh, so it's a bit of a cross promotion here to get people in the Epicenter universe uh, to also you know start uh, listening to The Interop because there's so much happening in the interchain ecosystem right now, and I think like there's a lot of interest for it, and we've seen that like with all of this new content coming out. And what I want to do with this podcast is. Um, bring more technical discussions. So the kinds of conversations that we have on Epicenter, you know, the very deep technical discussions, but that also go like high, kind of high level and looking at the ecosystem, um, you know, at, at like a 10,000 feet level. I want to have those conversations about about the interchain and the Cosmos ecosystem. But yeah, for, for listeners who aren't familiar with you, I mean, you've been in the Tendermint uh, and Cosmos uh, kind of ecosystem for a really long time. You were like an early employee at Tendermint. Um, tell us a bit about like, 
you know, how you, your background. I, I think also Sonny is the person who um, kind of got you hired at Tendermint or introduced you to the Tendermint uh, organization back in the day. Like, give us a bit of a background here on like how you came into into this world. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, I, I was one of the, f- I would say like first employees uh, at Tendermint. Um, but more importantly, I was also like one of the first interns uh, from Tendermint. So I was part of um, blockchain in Berkeley as part of my semester abroad that I did a user Berkeley. And uh, while being at blockchain in Berkeley, uh, Sonny had just uh, dropped out during that semester and he started working at Cosmos uh, Tendermint. And Sonny saw my work that I was doing with the Blockchain Berkeley organization, working with different uh, Fortune 500 companies, developing smart contracts, etc. And he introduced me to the uh, Tendermint team that was working super hard back then. Uh, it was post ICO, so they were like working super hard on, uh, on developing all the functionalities of Cosmos. Back in the day, they started working on the Cosmos SDK. They had uh, Peggy, and they also had, uh, of course, Ethermint, uh, which is a precursor project of Evmos. And um, they saw my work, and um, yeah, I applied for an internship, and I started working with them. And then once I graduated, I moved to a full-time position and relocated to Berlin. Yeah, because you were initially working from the San Francisco office, I think, and then you then moved to the Berlin office where you're now based. What was it like at, in the early days of working at, at Tendermint? Um, what was the vibe there? Dude, it was super rushed. There were so many projects going on. There was uh, Peggy, which was a former name of Gravity Bridge as well. Um, Ethermint, uh, Tendermint Core, um, Cosmos SEK, and Gaia, which initially was only part of the Cosmos SDK, but then like it uh, was moved to another code base so that you can have like separation of concerns and uh, the Cosmos Hub could uh, evolve into its own particular code base with different functionalities, et cetera. Um, like the ones we now see with the gravity decks, et cetera. Um, yeah, so lots of projects, uh, teams working on uh, on, on all these different uh, initiatives, um, interns working on and everything back in the day. Um, when I joined full time, I was working on the uh, Boyager wallet. I'm not sure if you remember that. Uh, with Jordan and, and, and Fabo, uh, they were the first ones to introduce uh, UI for Cosmos with the governance. They implement, we implemented also the ledger. Um, the ledger UI for to connect directly with uh, the ledger Cosmos applications that had just launched, and yeah, it was uh, exciting times back in the days. And w- when did you start working on putting an EVM on on Tendermint? I think you were part of the first uh, kind of team within uh, the Tendermint organization to uh, start working on that project. So uh, I didn't work exactly on Ethermint back in the days. I was mostly working on either Voyager, um, Peggy, uh, so Gravity Bridge, and I also worked on uh, uh, the Cosmos SDK. Uh, but when in, so like initially Ethermint, which was this first uh, iteration of EVM on top of uh, the Tendermint consensus, Tendermint core. Uh, consensus engine. Um, it was developed first as a Tendermint application, which is the base layer that the Cosmos SDK now implements. And then it migrated fully to um, like a Cosmos application, so a Cosmos based chain. And that took a while and was uh, spearheaded by Jackson Poling, who coincidentally was hired um, to. PM the Ethermint project, and then once uh, once more resources were required for the Cosmos Hub, he switched teams and started working on on that project. Um, we were also working with Alex Bess. Um, yeah, Bess was um, 
a core contributor for a long time and also started working on Ethermint and then migrated entirely to the Cosmos SDK and the rest of the Tendermint core. And basically he's, he's been working on the full, like the full stack of uh, Cosmos applications for a while. So yeah, I, I worked, yeah. But so back to your original question, when did I start working? It was, uh, in 2020 when I was uh, contracting for Chainsafe, um, so after I left Tendermint, I started um, freelancing and working for different entities, and and one of them was uh, one of them was a Chainsafe, and I started working on Ethermint because they they had received a grant from the ICF to work on Ethermint. So I want to get straight into Evmos here, and uh, you know I I heard you say on a community call I think it was a couple of weeks ago that. Um, what you're doing is difficult. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's difficult enough to build, uh, to, to build applications on blockchains. There's all sorts of things that need to be taken into account that perhaps, um, are abstracted away in, you know, web development or like more mature development environments. There's just the fact that it's decentralized. You have to take you, you have to take all these stakeholders into account. Um, there's the fact that you know, like you have to keep the, the the chain secure with like the validators or miners. And but you guys are adding like an extra complexity onto this, which is uh, you know like marrying these two technologies that weren't uh, made like weren't, weren't made to work together initially. I think and. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm coming at this with like uh, not not a very technical uh, eye, but like it seems to me that these technologies are are, are not um, well suited to go together. B can you break down like why building an EVM on Tenement consensus uh, and and then like in integrating IBC into that technology stack is so complex? So the main problem that we see in integrating not only to the call to Tendermint specifically, but to the rest of the Cosmos ecosystem, is the lack of um, support for Ethereum tools, Ethereum keys. Uh, so, for example, one very particular case that has been super hard for us to like go through, and we had to take we we had to make like really uh, tough decisions in terms of like how can we improve user experience. Uh, was the the lack of support for Ethereum keys on the Cosmos ecosystem? Because um, Cosmos only supports one type of key that is the one that it's shared across the Cosmos Hub, etc. So, like when you create your address, it's always in that key format, um, which is which is SACP two five six K one. Coincidentally, Ethereum also implements that. Uh, key but has a different derivation for the private key to the address so the address generated with the same key is different and that results in just imagine you going to kepler wallet and opening your tab and then if you export that private key and then you import it to say metamask you have a completely different key um like a different address so to say that's one case and then the other thing just like misc things like for example the address format on ethereum is uh hex addresses like 0x blah 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 and then um cosmos you have like back 32 so you need to create compatibility for the user to in order to okay i'm now using a cosmos address i should expect to use the back 32 the back 32 format so like the ones that start with cosmos or Ev or evmos in our case or uh osmos osmosis um so you have like all these formats that are different that's more like on the ux kind of thing um and then on top of that you have the problem that in the in tendermint consensus um, it's BFT, so fast finality. So there's no concept of uh, pending state. So when you have to wait for the transactions to finalize, sometimes on Ethereum you have like transaction pending on the on on um, Etherscan, um, like all this functionality that on Tendermint is is not there because there's never I don't know there's never been a use case that needs to support handling pending state because like the 
the state is is committed to the chain. Yeah, it's not probabilistic like in like in Ethereum or proof of proof of work blockchains. So it goes through the mempool, the, the transaction is verified internally and then broadcasted to the rest of the network, and then the the, the transaction is finalized. But on on Ethereum, you actually need to have a probabilistic finality, so like a Nakamoto consensus where uh, the, the, there need to be like confirmations uh, for the transactions in order to be included to the to the heaviest um, subtree as well. I'm not exactly sure how uh, Polygon works under the hood, but my understanding is that Polygon is, uh, is an EVM chain on, on Tendermint, right? What's different about Polygon and, and Evmos, aside from the fact that maybe there's IBC on Evmos? So the main difference is the architecture. Polygon was created in a way to entirely support the Ethereum ecosystem and to uh, create checkpoints to the Ethereum blockchain. So you can, even though you have fast finality on the Tendermint consensus, you can you can eventually roll back to the previous uh, to the previous uh, blocks if um, if needed be. So the the approach here is different, and then I, I think they're working on a Cosmos SDK, but they're still implementing checkpointing. The staking uh, the staking um, approach is different, so it's not very modular. And I think they're working on like an SDK as well, um, a Polygon SDK, so that they can have more. Uh, chains that are EVM compatible in their ecosystem, but the the modular approach that they have is very different from the ones that we can find right nowadays on Cosmos, because they don't need to run into this issue of like oh compatibility between Cosmos and Ethereum, and and they took the approach of like creating the or drafting the entire architecture based on Ethereum, so they don't have to handle any of the Cosmos cases. Okay. Yeah, understood. And when when Ethereum starts moving, uh, when the EVM, I mean, like basically Ethereum two is going to be fast finality proof of stake. Uh, it, are are there aspects of like the E two EVM or whatever that should look like that uh, make it easier for Evmos to implement, where you don't have to. Uh, take into account this this technical debt that has to do with proof of work. Um, so most of the components from proof of work we actually uh, are are not relevant to us. So for example, the on the JSON RPC, the miner namespace, or setting the Coinbase address for the miner, like all that stuff. So like the the validator itself is the one that is. Um, using all this functionality itself and it's all handled through the Cosmos component of Evmos, which is, which are the Cosmos SDK modules. Um, whereas on Ethereum, it's all handled through like the internal Geth architecture or like in this case, uh, um, yeah, the, the ETH2 architecture. So like one big thing is like, even though Ethereum I evolved to ETH2.0, um, we still need to ensure that compatibility with uh, some of the existing tooling. And so there are two approaches here. Either you reduce compatibility with, uh, say, MetaMask uh, or other um, EVM explorers, clients, etc., tools, or by, for example, just implementing the EVM and you define your own say, JSON RPC endpoints and whatever, um, and which will cause all these clients to break, or you start, you need to all the time try to catch up with the latest developments or the latest versions uh, supported of mainnet on Ethereum. So there's an, a double effort in, in terms of like supporting all the Cosmos ecosystem tooling, uh, supporting all the Ethereum ecosystem tooling and trying to catch up with whatever the latest uh, state of Ethereum is, and implement new functionalities on top of that. So our team, our team, which is uh, fairly small, is able to quickly adapt and and catch up with Ethereum and implement all these new functionality for the EVM, 
uh, for the Atmos EVM and also implement new functionality in terms of like token economics, um, interoperability, etc. So we're looking to hire more core engineers and also full stack engineers that can help us like merge and uh, marry these two uh, ecosystem into a single user experience that is uh, really smooth for the end user. Yeah, so let's let's talk about this. Like, so there's lots of things here I think that need to be unpacked. So, you know, the the user experience, the ecosystem of applications, the types of features, and you know, you talked about tokenomics and um, uh, Evmos had a, a, a novel approach to you know launching the chain, which was the rec drop. It's been covered extensively, and I don't want to go like too much in the details here. But you know, just uh, for you know. I, I think most of our listeners will be familiar with the fact that there was an attempt to launch uh, FMOS a couple of weeks ago. Um, that attempt, um, well, for lack of a better term, it failed. And we'll get into what happened later in the interview. But what is the current state of affairs, and um, how um, you know how does this um, affect? You know, effectively, either the um, the enthusiasm around the network launching, and ha have you seen any uh, evidence that what was like like a highly, I think, hyped project with a lot of enthusiasm? Have you seen any evidence that that is going away, or is the community, you know, or is is the community like uh, confident and and sort of supporting you in your efforts to relaunch the chain? The upgrade, as you mentioned, didn't go as, as, as smooth as we wanted to. Um, there were like different bugs, especially because of the the lack of support from different like Cosmos tools, and uh, there were also like some edge cases that we had to handle in terms of IBC because you now besides having like all the functionality on Cosmos, the functionality on the EVM, uh, we also need to handle all these edge cases for um for IVC. And yeah, definitely it, I think the hype has lowered a little bit. I am confident that once we launch again um and we restart the chain, the hype will continue and but mostly because users will be able to claim their tokens um through the dashboard super easy and um, will be able to like stake their tokens natively. And uh, there are also a lot of projects already trying to build and deploy in Avmos. And also like a few of them are uh, creating er uh, creating um, a few airdrops so that the community can also like benefit early on. And, and I think the earlier the users start to stake and, and, and use their tokens for LPing, et, et cetera, um, the quicker the hype will return. I think it has also been really humbling for us, for the team, so then we're not here for the hype, but we're also like trying to build as much as possible and try to, I don't know, improve our processes, improve the functionality that we want to bring and ensure that we implement the changes. And this is one key difference with other EVM ecosystems. I believe is that we are not only tackling this from a like core protocol infra, uh, perspective, like the infrastructure that supports the smart contracts, but we're also trying to push for products that support um, the protocol. So like the dashboard, um, we've been closely working with Kepler in order to support Ethereum signing. Um, we are adding, for example, MetaMask support for Cosmos transactions so that users can use um, their MetaMask wallet with Cosmos and Ethereum. So like trying to create this user experience natively, and we need to ensure that this is not only supported on the, in the protocol side, but it's also supported on the product side. And I think the, the protocol itself was ready. I think what was missing was more QA in terms of like the tooling and um, the, the product itself and uh how, how are you doing through all this uh, how, how are you holding up through this uh this ordeal 
Yeah, it was hard during the, the, the first week, I think, but um, our team is also very supportive and the community is very supportive. Um, I think a lot of people were like super hyped and also the price of the token and whatnot. But um, for the ones that know us and we've, we've been working and building for so long and we were the only team that was able to finally launch this after more than more than six years already. So yeah, we went back and building to build and and be able to support these um, new functionalities that we wanted to add and uh, and go back to the uh, drawing board and test every functionality that we wanted. So I'm yeah, I've, I've been able to hold up with the support of friends, family, and also the community that is supporting us. But I think once we restart the chain, it's going to be like the best user experience you will see. Yeah, I'm. I'm really. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about like the launch plan and everything towards the end here. But yeah, let, let's let's dive into uh, you know some of the um, some of the things that uh, Evmos uh, brings in terms of you know, innovation to the EVM, like currently or like when the chain launches, but then also uh, yeah, you know, into the future and the roadmap for the chain. Um, get, yeah, can, can you uh, can you break all that down for us? Yeah, so we now have a bunch of projects that are looking to deploy to Evmos in the first uh, week or two after restarting, um, including Ave and other blue chip projects. And we have a lot of new projects that are deploying into the Evmos ecosystem because they saw the potential of like the new token, the innovative token token model that we created. So there are multiple branches in terms of like the future roadmap that we want to implement. One of them is, of course, core protocol. Like, what is the chain going to support in the future, besides just AVM and 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 the default interoperability that Cosmos allows you. And then the others, the other side is like, what are we doing in terms of products in order to support these all these use cases? Um, and in terms of the protocol, we've been also like working closer with Celestia for seven months, and this is something that we're really looking forward to implement and eventually deploy once Celestia is ready, uh, which is um, a settlement layer for Celestia rollups. So it's basically a rollup on like supporting EVM rollups on top of Evmos EVM, and. That's one thing. The other thing is working on interoperability and uh, interoperability not only in the sense of transferring assets. Uh, we are already supporting ERC20 tokens um, to be transferred uh, in and out from the Evmos chain. But we're also looking forward to enable interchain composability so that chains like Sommelier or Region Network who have specific use cases targeting DeFi can directly call smart contracts deployed in Evmos and uh, make sense of that data by unpacking the events and then um, realizing, okay, like here's here's the event data that was logged uh, on the Evmos smart contract. What am I going to do with that? And, and then like they handle like specific use cases, like for example, in Sommelier, they can uh, rebalance LP positions or um, work directly with Aave. So this brings a lot of benefits in terms of uh, reduces latency. If you're using Gravity Bridge or any other bridge existing, any existing bridge currently deployed in the ecosystem, because IVC will drastically decrease the latency, and then the the transaction fees will be way lower. So I expect a lot of interest in this functionality from other teams um, in order to support communication directly with smart contracts. And that's one thing. The other in particular is NFT, uh, NFT interoperability. We're also working closely with um, the Stargaze team in order to transfer NFTs from the from the Evmos AVM into the Cosmo Wasm environment that they use. And so like making interoperable NFTs um, is gonna be something huge for the rest of the ecosystem and for um, GameFi. In particular, so that we can support uh, application-specific blockchains or as application-specific EVMs that are directly sharing security with Evmos, for example, and 
be able to directly use this functionality to transfer NFT assets. And yeah, like that's that's more or less what we're doing. And in the future, we're also going to be supporting um, cross-chain NFT, like delegate calls from one chain to another. And then, yeah, once you once we implement that, we'll be able to share composability between uh, EVM chains. So that uh, a chain that is on a, a smart contract that is deployed on Evmos can uh, communicate directly with a smart contract that is deployed, for example, on Kronos or other EVM chain that will be deployed in the future. So I'm, I really want to dive into this, uh, in this interoperability aspect because I think there's different components of it that um, maybe, at least I, I don't fully understand. So if, if you're used to using, uh, if you're used to using sort of interchain uh, or IBC assets, uh, you, you can move assets from one chain to the other. So if you have assets on, uh, you have like atoms, you can move those atoms over to uh to uh, osmosis, for instance, and then those atoms live there, and then you can move them back to another. So, from the user perspective, it's seamless, and uh, I think like people kind of understand that once they've used it. What's that going to look like for Evmos? Uh, or, so, I, I pres- my, the way I'm thinking about it is like, okay, so you'll be able to move assets outside of Evmos, but these are not uh, IBC assets or like ERC twenty tokens or kind of EVM. Uh, tokens, and then what's the interaction with other EVMs? So, uh, what you know, Ethereum or uh, Polygon, or what? How does that? Uh, how does Evmos create interoperability also with those chains? So the Evmos interoperability uh, components are, yeah, they're they're multiple, and the main one. Of course, it's IVC in the in the Cosmos ecosystem. So IVC allows us, as you mentioned, to transfer native assets from the Cosmos hub from Osmosis directly into the Evmos. But unfortunately, the the native functionality for of IVC doesn't allow conversions of those tokens directly to um, to the Evmos EVM. So you need to create sort of like uh, a mapping between like ERC-20 tokens and Cosmos IVC tokens. So for example, like a Cosmos uh, hub atom or an Osmosis uh, token that has been, that has been to- transferred over via IVC. How do you represent now those tokens within the EVM and how then those tokens are bridged over, which is the second component I want to talk about. How are those tokens now bridged over uh, through their ERC-20 representation to other chains. And that's going to be through Nomad and uh, Connects and other bridges that w- are deploying uh, on Evmos. So we're going to see an influx of all these ERC-20 tokens from all these different chains, uh, Polygon, Avalanche, and uh, Ethereum, of course, uh, Moonriver and Moonbeam, to the Evmos and Cosmos ecosystem. And then those tokens, those ERC-20 tokens will be able to be converted to the Cosmos IBC representation so that they can be transferred over to Cosmos Hub or Osmosis. So it's going to create a lot of liquidity. So we expect Evmos to become the main point of entry from all the EVM ecosystem uh, for all these assets to come through these bridges to Evnos, and then through this functionality that we're allowing these ERC-20 tokens to be converted, those tokens will now be able to be transferred via IVC to the rest of the Cosmos ecosystem. Okay, so let's just take an example here. Let's say I have uh, USDC on uh, on on Ethereum uh, or or even Polygon, or like any EVM chain that supports USDC. Uh, I'll have to move those through a bridge, which will either... So the, right now, you've talked about Nomad and Connects. So those are two separate bridges that will be EVM uh, Evmos compatible. Move those assets into Evmos. And then from there, you can take those USDC assets. Uh, there's a some sort of conversion that happens that you allows you to move them 
into the native interchain uh, assets that we're all used to moving around. Yeah, so like changing the address format more or less. Um, you're you're changing the format for how the token is represented on chain. Either it's like an ERC twenty token format or it's a Cosmos token format. Okay, and will those be fungible? Like, say you move them from Connex or you move them from Nobat, are, are those going to be fungible once they're in, in, F, in FMOS? Yeah. So there is a direct mapping. So uh, governance approve uh, token pair. So that the token pair is just a mapping between the Cosmos and the ERC20 asset. So that um, there's only one canonical representation for, um, say, WETH on Ethereum for um, USDC, so that there's like a, only one token um, so that this ensures fungibility and then this token will be able to be transferred via IBC to other chains. Okay, and is fungibility also insured? So they're, they're insured via these two bridges, but is it insured, like is a, is a Polygon USDC or a Polygon wrapped ETH equivalent or infungible to a Ethereum wrapped ETH once it arrives in Evmos? Or are those still kind of separate tokens? So the, the, the fungibility needs to be, the fungibility between like all these bridges is something that we're currently working with multiple teams. Frax is already working, it's also deploying on Evmos. And so, yeah, like, as you mentioned, there, there are going to be like multiple bridges. It's the same as with, it's the same as the problem with IVC and fungibility. When you relay the same token via, via different uh, sort of like IVC routes, um, the tokens are not fungible because there are different security guarantees in all these different chains that the token has passed through. So that someone needs to basically assume the risk and um, having, well, I wouldn't say like a canonical bridge because it's not maintained by the team, but there's like a preferred way of routing all these different chains, it has different options on security levels, also helps in terms of fungibility. I would expect different also like DeFi protocols, state like Curve or, or uh, I think it's Kinesis, the name of the project that is also going to do like stable swap, um, sta a stable coin AMM. Um, so yeah, to handle all of these fungibility issue. Yeah, I was talking to the Kinesis guys uh, the other day and it seems like they want to uh, address this fungibility issue, which exists, like it's independent of FMOS, right? It, it, this exists uh, already in the Ethereum ecosystem. And there was some debate, you know, around, I think it was a couple months ago where like, w about which bridges should uh, be, should be allowed on osmosis and like Sonny weighed in with, like his opinion, which was we need to limit um, or like we, we, it, at, at least for now, we, we can't create an, an experience where there's all these representations of the same assets, which creates like a user experience that's degraded for for end users. Um, like we've seen on Ethereum, right, where you have like 20 different representations of USD assets, for example, like on the same um, on the same uh, liquidity pool. Uh, or in the, like on the same, like on Uniswap, for instance. So w why are there two bridges? Why why Nomad and Connex and why not like a canonical bridge? Um, so Nomad and Connex are able to provide, it's, it's, it's sort of like the same bridge under, like underlying bridge. It's uh, Connex is using like Nomad infrastructure, but there are different options for um, in terms of speed of the transfer, in terms of like, because um, it's an optimistic bridge and there are different like pros and cons of using like an, an optimistic bridge in terms of latency or like how like if, if the transaction is optimistic and then you you have this uh, a period that you can uh, that you can challenge basically the transfer um, so they're they're more or less uh, two sides of the same coin 
um, in terms of like using the same infrastructure by offering different like options to the user. Okay, and, and will what what about the um, sort of interchain accounts and the ability for like a, 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 a an address on like on Cosmos or on Osmosis to control addresses and smart contracts on FMOS? What what, what is that going to be possible, and what kinds of things does that allow? Yeah, so interchain accounts is a it's a functionality that we're really interested in. To work on, um, we we wanted to implement it for for mainnet, but unfortunately the the IVC release wasn't ready. Um, so one of the cool things that we want to support is, for example, like you have all these funds, all these validators that have tons of atoms, tons of uh, osmosis, and other chain and other um, tokens. But how do you how do you manage the tokens safely? Uh, in an organization right now on, 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 on Cosmos. You need to create a multisig, like a two out of three, and there's no UI for it. If you've used a Cosmos multisig, you know the pains that I'm, that I, <laughs> that I'm explaining to you right now, because it's, it's really hard. Uh, we even, we've been core, uh, <laughs> core contributors and core engineers of the Cosmos ecosystem for a while now. And even us, we have an internal guide of uh, how to make a transfer with the Cosmos multisig, which only is supported on the terminal CLI. Yeah, this, this, is, a, this is a huge pain point, I think, in, in, in Cosmos. It's and, a huge pain point. Yeah. And uh, one of the big things that we want to support is for accounts on the Cosmos Hub on Osmosis, to be able to manage and um, assets on, a, for example, a Gnosis multisig. So you can have the same assets and, and you can just use a Gnosis multisig for everything um, and manage your Cosmos uh, coins, your um, your Osmosis, your Evmos ERC20s, and uh, yeah, like Evmos tokens as well. So it's, it's going to be like... Improving the user experience is something that we really care about and using all these interoperability functionalities to also benefit the rest of the Cosmos ecosystem, I think it's going to be like a key component here. Yeah, I mean, that being able to use a product like Gnosis Multisig on, uh, on Cosmos would be just like amazing. I think, you know, they've really nailed the Multisig um, UX and, and feature set and... Um, I mean, I, I'm also kind of surprised that no one's built this already on on Cosmos. Maybe, maybe it'll come. I mean, like you got the guys working on DowDow, and there's like some you know multi sig there, but it's kind of clunky still, and the UX isn't great, and you, you can't add addresses. And the, the potential is there, but it's it's not it's not a production product. Yeah, I think you can in the contracts, but like the contracts support those calls, but you still have to do like a you know command line um, thing to to get that to work. Yeah. So what 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 will be the DeFi component? Well, like what what kind of DeFi applications will be launched on FMOS? You mentioned Ave earlier, uh, but are there you know native projects uh, that are uh, anticipated to launch there and? I think, like broadly, what, what what will be the DeFi experience on FMOS, and how will it be different from what we're used to in Ethereum, and and maybe you know, how is it different from uh, Osmosis? What does it bring to the table? For the team, it's more or less the same, but now it enables them to so for all of these um, chains to access the token directly via IVC. And for the token to be transferred via IVC, which also provides uh, more liquidity to the project. Additionally, you have the token model that allows users and users for these all these protocols to spend 50% of the transaction fee uh, and, and those 50% transaction fee goes to the validators and 50% of the transaction fee goes to the develop the developer team uh, so the contract owners and so like that is able to fund additional sources um, like and provide additional funding for the team 
that's more like um, like why is it better? It, it's able. It has lower transaction fees. It has uh, additional liquidity sources. So from all of these EVM chains and also from the Cosmos ecosystem, and uh, with the new interchain composability component, as I mentioned before, other chains will be directly able to interact with these smart contracts via IVC. And also the smart contracts on Evmos will be able to call at the other smart contracts that are supported on the EVM, on the Evmos EVM on other chains, for example. So you don't need, you don't need to um, fragment composability at all. Okay, got it. So the, the, that's one thing I, I remember hearing about, but I forgot is that um, transaction fees can go in, 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 in a DeFi application on FMOS, transaction fees can go to the liquidity provider, but they can also go to, or sorry, not transaction fees, but the swap fees can also go to the validator. Yeah, so the, the key thing here is normally on Ethereum, and this is, this is also a key difference with the rest of the EVM ecosystem is on Ethereum and other EVM ecosystems, if you're paying the transaction fee, that transaction fee is going directly to the block proposer, uh, either the miner or the validator. Um, here, instead, the main difference is that 50% goes to the um, developer and then 50% goes to the block proposer. To the developer, right, to the developer of the, of the, of the contract, of the contract, yeah. Yes. What this creates effectively is a decentralized uh, marketplace and decentralized app store where the users that are interacting with a with a product with a DeFi application are paying fifty percent of the transaction fee to the developer and fifty percent of the transaction fee to the block proposer. And it's not that they are paying an extra fifty percent; it's just that the fee that they're already paying, uh, same as Ethereum or other EVM chains, is now being split between the two like the two organizations or the or the developer and the block proposer. Uh, what this ensures like alignment uh, with their protocol itself so that the validators still get the rewards that they're generated through the validation of the protocol and, and proof of stake. Plus they get 50% of the transaction fees. But now you're also incentivizing all these developers to come deploy their applications to Evmos and this creates a larger, it's like chicken and egg problem. Like how do you instant, how do you bring in more users if there are no applications? And um, through this, you're also incentivizing new developers to come in and deploy um, through this, uh, what we call DAP store model. So th this is a really novel, uh, I think, uh, functionality in, in blockchains generally. I, I don't think that there's any other chain that does this where the smart contract developer is also remunerated for uh, transaction fees. Um, do you think this is something that other chains will adopt? Like, is this something that you could see kind of spreading in the EVM ecosystem as well? Yeah, I think there are a lot of, I mean, so if you think about the way of funding a team right now, the teams either um, raise funding uh, for the company, like traditional uh, sources of funding, go to VC, go to like early angel investors and they provide like, um, yeah, they, they dilute themselves in order to attract new investors. And then you also have like the token model where they launch a new token and they distribute that and the team holds a large per the percentage of the token. Um, but if you think about it, there hasn't been uh, like a sustainable, long sustainable um, funding mechanism that is directly correlated with the usage of the application. So the more users interact with the application here on Evmos, the more transaction fees the developer will get. So it's a long sustainable, and it's and it's in parallel to these two other funding models that I, I mentioned before. But it's a more like it's a healthier one in the long term because it's a, it allows you 
generate uh, continuous revenue to the developer team. Yeah, it like totally changes the economics, I think, for the developer team. And um, when a developer launches a contract, uh, are these are these parameters that you can set? Say, okay, I want to take like fifty percent, or I can take less, or like if I don't want to have any other transaction, like you know, different different uh, different contracts might have um, uh, different ideas about how these fees should be uh, repartitioned between the miners and, or the validators and the and the contracts uh, or the teams. Um, it, is this like by default, or is it something that you can set up? Yeah, so it's set by default, um, or, or like this. This is something that we need to we need to still analyze with with the core team. Um, but for now, the the current specification that we have, it's it's set in by default. But what you can do as a developer is, if you don't want to actually earn these rewards, you can set the address that you want to. Instead of you, the developer team, receiving fifty percent of the transaction fees. You could um, redirect those uh, tokens to the community pool if you want, or to the validators themselves. So you can get the validator address um, and then reward the validator. Or if you want to allocate those tokens to like the entire pool of validators, you can also distribute them to the entire pool of validators. Um, so there are different options here, and you can even you can even like set another contract uh, developer address or or fund another contract uh, through this mechanism. Yeah, or you could fund some charity or, or something exactly. like that. Exactly. And uh, that's totally up to the developer and they can change the address whenever they want. Does does that, do you, I mean, do you think that, so let's say we have developer, because then you, you I, I, it seems like you get in this situation where developers are competing also for their transactions to get processed. So like if a developer uh, is awarding more um, of the transaction fees to the validator, so awarding less transaction fees for themselves, then there may be an incentive for those transactions to go through um, first. Is that is that something that is... Is is taken into account here, or does that not really come into play? At the moment, so at the moment, the trans the uh, Tendermint mempool only supports uh, um, uh, first in first out queue. So you send a transaction with uh, say a hundred tokens in fees, and then you send a transaction with a thousand tokens in fees. The one that was processed before is actually executed before. Unless you run some like fork of Tendermint where you modify the uh, mempool internals completely, um, it's not currently supported, but I think the next um, major Tendermint version is supporting like prioritized queue and we'll definitely need to take that into account, but the current, the current model doesn't support it um, straight ahead. And, but yeah, this is something, well, depending when these functionality is released, we'll need to take into account. So if we, if we deploy this functionality first, we don't need to account for this particular um, case, but uh, once we want to upgrade to the latest uh, Tendermint version, we'll have to, we'll have to consider this for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what what other kinds of innovative things is Evmos uh, does it, are integrated in Evmos that you know don't exist in other EVM chains or what other innovative things that are 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 you implementing in the token model? So the other innovative thing that we took uh, from existing DeFi applications is uh, the concept of usage rewards. So. If you read the uh, RecDrop token model, um, you can see that we airdrop tokens uh, to users on Ethereum based on the gas that they've spent, um, which is called the gas drop model. And the more you spend on gas on different contracts, the more tokens you get airdrop. And so we 
wanted to implement this on the protocol level for users that interact natively with different contracts. So what we're doing is taking the OP incentive model that Osmosis has, uh, so like incentivizing the liquidity pools, we're implementing this, but for smart contracts. So the more gas you spend on smart contracts, uh, the more usage rewards you will get. So you're incentivizing certain contracts. So for example, bridging could be incentivized or AMM swaps could be, or like, I don't know, like an NFT marketplace could be incentivized. And this is all voted through governance. So the community votes for which are gonna be the contracts that are gonna be incentivized. Yeah, uh, you define a number of uh, weeks that you want these incentives to run and then you, yeah, you're basically incentivizing on all the users that interact with this contract. So it's going to be like a growth hack mechanism because now if you have this contract that is incentivized and also the developers are getting transaction fees, the users are getting tokens just for using the application, but they're paying with the transaction fees, right? And then half of those transaction fee will go directly to the developer team, which will attract more developers, more contracts get incentivized, and more users interact with the protocol itself. So it's creating a positive reinforcement cycle in which you are attracting more developers and more users over time. So, you know, are, are, are you confident that FMOS um, will also act as a growth hacking mechanism for the interchain IBC ecosystem because like you know as a as a developer it makes sense to go deploy your contract there um, there's going to be a number of blue chip uh, uh, number of blue chip um, eth ethereum uh, dapps that are going to deploy there and like Ave is one of them um, the liquidity it'll be pretty seamless to move liquidity in and out of evmos yeah Kepler is Kepler is supported natively with Ethereum signing. MetaMask is supported natively with traditional Ethereum signing plus Cosmos signing transactions through EIP 712, which is a meta transaction standard. So now with MetaMask, you can sign IBC. So you don't need to add any new functionality to the existing project or to your existing client. You just need to support um, EIP 712 if you are using like a UI, for example. Yeah, I think it's going to be huge for the ecosystem because attracting new developers and new, pro and new projects in general and new users that are native from the Ethereum ecosystem is also going to attract more tokens, more use cases for the interchain ecosystem. Yeah, I, I was part of the core IVC team and uh, we're close uh, with other teams in the ecosystem. So all this functionality that is going to be deployed on Evmos is going to be available to the entire Cosmos ecosystem through IBC. And this is something that we're not going to try to, for example, like capture all this value only for the Evmos chain, but we want all this, all this liquidity to come into the Cosmos ecosystem, all these different use cases to come into the Cosmos ecosystem, all this new functionality from the Ethereum tool use, um, from this Ethereum tooling that already works and is already supported by multiple teams is going to be available for like the, the one that I explained with the multisig is going to be available for the rest of the our Cosmos ecosystem um, through interchain accounts, for example. Yeah. And all of the DAO tooling and all, I mean, all, all of the, yeah, I mean, this is like the, the Solidity and the EVM have such an advance, I think, on like any other other uh, blockchain in terms of tooling. Um, yeah, it, it, I think this makes so much sense. And something I tweeted about um, just before the call and that we're really excited to work on is creating like a product um, for new product to make it super easy to deploy contracts uh, to Avimos, but also but also um, airdropping new tokens to Avimos stakers to uh, gas gasler contracts. So the same that we implemented for the gas drop and the rec drop mech and the rec drop 
will be available for users to just like select those parameters, filter the con, uh, fil like select some filters, like um, leave out some centralized exchanges, select a few validators they want, set up minimum amount, set up a minimum amount of gas they want, select IVC transactions, governance participation, and then you get a CSV file or, or like an X a spreadsheet with all the information of all the addresses that is publicly verified because you will also get the amount of the, the list of queries that you can also run manually in order to verify this. And then you will be able to airdrop the tokens directly to those addresses um, by by using it directly on the on the EVM. Okay, this this is this this is huge. So I mean, you 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 essentially you, you've got to build all of this data scraping uh, infrastructure to do this, right? I mean, this is a centralized tool that you're describing. It's not a it's not an on chain tool. Yeah, it's a centralized. It's uh, it's basically, it's basically the mechanism that we implemented already for the rep drop, but turning it into a product, not only for ourselves because we already implemented the the rep drop mechanism and we also already selected the the contracts, the the users from that had uh, staked on Osmosis and Cosmos Hub, etc. But we're also uh, supporting this mechanism for new projects that want to deploy to Evmos to be able to use this tool without any, like it's without think, without just spending months and months into like selecting the contracts and stuff. You just need to select the contract address. You just need to select like, oh, what's the minimum amount of gas that I want? And then you can run these query, big query, of course. <laughs> And then you get all these addresses and you get the amount of tokens that you want because you are also be inputting the, the, you also provide the, as an input the amount of tokens that you want. And then you, yeah, you just get the addresses. Okay. That's, that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's a, that's, that's a product that you could, you could probably, you know, uh, charge for like, uh, as a separate, as a, even like a separate product. So, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to zoom out a little bit and, and talk a little Talk about the interchain smart contract uh, landscape, if you will. You know, there is like Cosm Wasm has a decent decent sized foothold, I think, in the Cosmos ecosystem with like Juno being you know one of the main chains where people can deploy Cosm Wasm contracts. Um, other chains are also implementing Cosm Wasm. Yeah, Terra. Osmosis. Yeah, Terra, Osmosis, Club, I think is probably also going to do it at some point, um, or a key chain. Um, you know, the, then we have Agoric that a lot of people are you know, very excited about, and now Evmos. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, my, my feeling is that this fragmentation... It could go either way. Like, I mean, the fragmentation could be good for the ecosystem because it creates a lot of uh, different types of applications and use cases. But I think that alignment also helps accelerate uh, development because everyone is kind of focused in on, on one thing. And my my thinking around this is as the ecosystem gets bigger and uh, lots of new people come into the ecosystem. Is this bizarre approach that Cosmos has always uh, kind of stood by going to work in creating a, a like a competitive ecosystem where people can actually like an ecosystem that can compete with you know the likes of Solana and you know Ethereum and uh, some of the other uh, big layer ones. I think a lot of these uh, chains will specialize in different use cases. Um, you have, of course, a base layer infrastructure like the, like the Evmos, the Junos, etc. But you will also see, like, application specific chains that have VMs that are specifically targeting a use case like Osmosis, um, Cosmo Wasm environment is probably not going to support, say, I don't know, random uh, governance, uh, smart contracts, or or whatever, like NFTs necessarily is that's going to be probably stargaze but it's uh on osmosis is going to have cosmos environment for for only DeFi. 
so it's kind of like even though they have like the same application underlying application they're kind of like narrowing down on the use case according to what they're already implementing on their chain that being said i think there's there's also going to be alignment between all these different protocols through ibc um even the even the the ones that don't necessarily have the same uh runtime like or same vm like cosmos Wasm, and, and evmos that uh, that implements the evm so once we implement the functionality for smart contracts on Evmos to call smart contracts on Juno or any Cosmo Wasm chain, like the uh, collaboration we're currently working with Stargate for NFTs, is going to be huge because then the, the, you'll have the same standard for calling smart contracts on, on both chains. And that's going to be creating a huge alignment uh, where the chains now don't actually need to compete necessarily, but they can also access benefits from the other counterparty chains that are that they are connected to. So, so there there will be so it won't matter what the underlying runtime is. Accounts on the interchain are going to be able to control contracts regardless of what the runtime is. Is what you're saying? Yeah, they will be able, like contracts on the EVM will be able to call contracts on Cosmos and vice versa. Uh, I think assets uh, like CW20, which is the uh, Cosmos representation of tokens, are going to be compatible with ERC20s on the EVM. And both of them are also going to be compatible with um, the Cosmos token format. Um, so the like creating standardization and creating like interoperability components with, between all these different runtimes and EVMs is also going to help solve many use cases and it's going to be able to provide more uh, functionalities like and and something that we haven't even talked about is like interchain farming. So farming on the interchain is something that I'm particular very particularly very very interested in. And um, it's it's a model that I call uh, interchain workflows, where you set up a workflow for one contract to be called in one chain, which calls another contract on another chain, or interacts with osmosis or whatever. You create the LP, you get the LP pools, and then you're creating the same uh, hype that you had on Ethereum in 2020 with uh, DeFi farming. Um, but you will now expanding that to the interchain because of the interoperability. Uh, and that is going to be huge. That is going to be huge. And, and in order for us to support these use cases, we need to provide interoperability between like these different EVMs, uh, different VMs. And uh, this is something I, I, like our team is personally really excited to work with and, and happy to work with any other team. And that's why we don't see, like for example, Juno or any other Cosmo Wasm chain as like competitors or anything. Like if you we are able to reach assets and reach contracts through IBC, it's gonna create so much so many opportunities for all the end users. Yeah, I mean I I, I fully, I fully am on. I'm fully on board with the idea that interoperability uh, just creates more value everywhere, and which is why I'm, I'm so bullish on 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 Cosmos and the interchain and uh, what IBC brings in terms of, uh, you know, all these ecosystems being able to um, to interoperate. And we haven't talked about like Polkadot, also like the ability for you know Polkadot assets to move uh, in and out of the interchain. Um, yeah, I think like interoperability is is uh, is the way that we're going. Yeah, and 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 Evmos will be a point of entry for all these Polkadot from from us in the um, Polkadot ecosystem, and also from Kusama. I'd like to kind of close this part of the conversation um, for uh, for now and, and move to. You know what happened uh, in the uh, in the days leading up to the launch and after the launch. Uh, we talked about this earlier that the, the launch has been um, now pushed back. And so, for those of you listening on Epicenter, 
there will be a link in the show notes where you can get um, the rest of this conversation. So you'll have to come to the Interop uh, podcast uh, wherever uh, wherever you, you want to listen to it, whether on Spotify or on your podcast player or on YouTube, and you'll be able to listen to the rest of this interview. And I hope while you're there, you're also subscribed uh, so that you can get all of the uh, all of the episodes as they're released.